So good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome um, to the session on state and systems uh, leadership. Uh, we have two amazing leaders here with us uh, today, and you'll be hearing from them throughout the course of the next uh, 39 or 40 minutes or so. Uh, as you can imagine, these two folks are, are the forefront of systems change. We'll be talking about how they think about the near term responsibilities and the future of K-12 K schooling, what they see as opportunities and barriers to modernization and the adoption of innovative uh, learning school models. So I want to welcome Dr. Julie Mergel and Dr. I'm going to call him Bill, Dr. Bill Height, uh, to this conversation. I've known Bill a long time, and I'm really happy to have met uh, Julie the last couple of weeks. Uh, Julie is the Chief Operating Officer at the Montana Office of Public Instruction. Uh, much of her focus has been on the state systems uh, um, uh, within that particular construct. And uh, as you all know, Bill was the, he's a former superintendent of the field of public schools and now the CEO of KnowledgeWorks, um, doing, a, doing an amazing job. Both of these folks do an amazing job in, in education. So let's, let's just uh, jump in and let me provide some context first, perhaps the first, uh, first couple of questions. Um, as you all know, the paper argues that there are two types of system is systemic inertia, inertia, sorry, getting in the way of transformation to innovative learning school models, one of which is a systemic inertia that is rooted in stakeholder mindsets and power dynamics. The paper also argues that it's not easy for school and district leaders to change because it is often viewed as overwhelmingly laborious or inherently risky that leaders may have themselves been successful educators within the industrial paradigm, that teachers may lose, may feel losing their autonomy in order to implement models that they did not create. And as a result, may feel like going back to square one. Okay. I personally have argued in the past that redefining success for students requires coordinated efforts from the classrooms to the school, to the greater society at large. So first question to, to both of you, um, what have you done in the past to attempt to change the hearts and minds of others? And how do we overcome the system inertia? Julie, we'll start with you. Thanks, Jean Claude. Um, so prior to returning home to Montana, I was in Denver Public Schools and did implement a middle school math program, um, Teach to One, which is now New Classrooms. And as I was thinking about your question, Jean, like there's lots of things that we've done to tweak the current system, the current industrial model system, whether it was from the way we did professional development to the way that we um, set up the classroom, uh, created a big, large learning space, or changed the master schedule to 90 minutes and put a team of uh, planning time at the start of the day. But there's lots of things that we did to tweak the system. But I think the things that resonate with me the most, there were a couple that I think about. One is about our students and their, their view of their selves as learners. Um, we had to really uh, undo what we taught them to do, um, the way they showed up in this space. They, they did not have learner agency. Um, they didn't know how to engage in a problem. They were so used to things being so scaffold for them that they were just waiting for the teacher to tell them, this is what you do next. There were some students who thrived on getting that opportunity to engage in learning that was personalized and met them right where they needed to be. And there were others who just said, let's go back to the way we did business before. I figured that out, basically. I knew how to operate in that system. I knew how to hide in that system. I knew how to cope. And you're now asking me to think. And I don't know how to do that. So that's one thing that stood out to me when I thought about uh, your question. Um, another piece was really uh, kind of difficult was this whole notion of you had to teach this curriculum to grade level standards and we were going to be held accountable with the summative assessment that was going to come at the end of the year. And what data did we have to prove that our kids were going to be prepared and perform on that assessment? And, um, you know, the the district like assistant superintendent level position, I had to spend so much time just convincing them, let it work. Um, and he was like, no, we need to implement, you know, once a week, we need to have some time when we, we, we have everybody on grade level content and be practicing for that test. 
because if we don't, the consequences of that um, are not good. So those were just two things when I thought about that model about the inertia for change. I was thinking in particular about the students themselves. And so we had to spend a lot of time on teaching the kids, okay, this is what it means to learn. This is what it means to monitor your own learning and to engage in your learning and to question. Um, and um, I had to spend a lot of time as a school leader fending off the, what if it doesn't align to grade level content? The consequences of that are gonna be um, severe. Julie, before, before, I go, before I go to over to you, Julie, just thinking about your position right now at the state level, what you said resonates completely. Uh, but how do you get that to actually happen from your position, thinking about you've got superintendents, you've got school principals, you've got teachers, all these layers between where you are and where the kids are. How do you operationalize that? So I guess, you know, that would be part of the motivation and wanting to really join the state superintendent on her initiative to innovate in assessment and pursue, you know, a state grant uh, from the Department of Education to say, can we redefine how we do assessment uh, for the summative model. So we were awarded that grant and we're doing a through year course assessment model that we're piloting here. And so going out to our district leaders and our teachers and our communities, uh, the superintendent has really been adamant about, hey, this isn't just also about while we're thinking about innovating in assessment, that means we also have to be innovating and learning at the same time. Um, and so what does that mean? So I think it's um, really identifying, Gene, those high levers at the state level to say, where can we help support innovation? Um, and I'm fortunate enough to work for a, 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 an individual, a state leader who really does want to see that assessment is and that accountability system is not disconnected from the learning. Um, and so within this system, how do we start knocking on the door to say, we got to change it? Awesome, thank you. Bill, what about you? Yeah, John claude thank you. Thanks, and thanks for having me here. And Julie, thank you for the work that you've done both in Denver and now in Montana. I think the question, John claude and, and you know, we, we've, all, we've all been in leadership roles at the district level, now Julie's at the state level, and, we all understand how using organizational efficiency in order to scale certain strategies and actions works counter to actually creating learner centered approaches, right? So, you know, we have this model that we're using simply because of efficiency. It's easy to do everything for everyone. Julie just talked about children who may or may not be on grade level in their content. And, and this is the system that has practiced this for, you know, the better part of, you know, a couple hundred years, right? So we've, we've practiced taking things to scale. And now we also understand a need for how do we have a more learner-centered approach where we're able to individualize the work um, of or the needs of young people and be more responsive to them, but specifically to your inertia and what we did in the, and, and I think the key term to your question was attempt. What did you attempt? Um, and we attempted to create opportunities for innovation by lifting structures and systems outside of the the overall system, if you will. So we tried to create opportunities for innovation by moving individuals outside of the system um, that was stifling the innovation. But guess what happened? The inertia of the system, the state practices, the state policies, the assessments, um, all just you know, beat the innovation back into that industrial paradigm. And, and what we try to actually create as the set of learner centered approaches actually became the just a different term for uh, a industrial industrialized approach 
uh, it just became a you know a happy term for it right so the innovation and what i've found is when that was done best and denver had did a lot of good work around this you did some work around this in chicago i mean what i found was those successful models were actually models that operated and were able to operate outside of current state policy around particularly around in, in pennsylvania you know their their seat time requirements their days their hours their credits um, their assessment requirements that regardless of what approach you take and so we 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 had one high school that was doing some incredibly unique types of things that they wanted to do around competencies but they could not crosswalk the competencies to the requirements of the state and actually had to work for several years in order to create something that was uh, evidence of mastery, if you will. And so I think as we do this work moving forward, we have to think about how do the system, how is the system structured to create the conditions for a learner-centered approach to occur? That, I mean, both of you are beginning to bleed into my next question around sort of high level barriers. Uh, reminds me of uh, uh, one of my favorite Michael Fullen articles where he talks about the three stories of school reform, the inside story, the inside outside story, and the outside inside story. Um, so can you both talk a little bit about the interplay that has to exist uh, when you think about schools, school systems, state systems, frankly, even the federal system, for a learner-centered approach to actually take root and take hold. What must be in place? You're both beginning to touch upon some of the uh, key, key challenges, but what kind of interplay must actually exist between all these systems? Yeah, so I, I'll start, Jean-Claude, if, if that's okay with you, Julie. Sure. <laughs> the, so, so I, I think one thing we've always thought about the system as this um as having the sole responsibility for creating uh, like these structures and which means that the it was always incumbent upon the system system to come up with whatever the, the solution was or is and and i think that as we think about those things that have been successful there's also been a lot of work outside of the system that is aligned to what we all want to see in terms of a profile of a graduate or a profile of a learner, um, and whether that is a business that's, that's providing internships, a college or university, or an after-school program or out-of-school time opportunity. There are multiple places for young people to engage in uh, the type of learner-centered approaches that we want but we have to coordinate, and in my opinion, we have to begin to coordinate and align many of those systems. But I think that all starts with coming up with the, a, a localized or a community-based profile of a graduate or profile of a learner, however we wanna call it, so that it is based upon uh, the things that are inherently unique to those communities now i will say this i will add this john claude that like the profile just can't be narrow to that community it also has to include a set of standards that we want to see all children achieve um, but if in fact that it is that there's a need for uh, uh, computer programmers in one place and flight engineers in another place and electricians in, a, in another place and in, in carpenters or, um, or um, some other type of web-based security expertise. I, th I think it has to be uh, coordinated and aligned with the, the aspirations from that community, not just from the, the, the sole entity, which has historically been the school system. Yes. What about you, Julie? I think, you know, just building on some things that Bill was saying, Gene, I think is that um, uh, just like the notion of this dynamic between the state being sure that we're, you know, providing and alleviating um, policies that are barriers, right? 
we also have to really change what we hold them accountable for. I mean, that's really, really important. So we recently, and we're still kind of in it in the state of Montana, um, when we're thinking about the state accountability of what we hold schools accountable for, um, we've really started to step back and say, do you have a graduate profile? Have you gone to your community and developed one that does align with local aspirations and, and, and is um, inspiring for the youth in your community? Um, because we've even, um, Montana's done a great job of addressing some of these policies to say, how do we get towards more proficiency-based model? So they have it in there. They've addressed some of these seat time matters, yet we don't see um, schools taking advantage of it or school boards taking advantage of it or leaders taking advantage of it. So to be able to say, you can offer a course equivalent and a school board can improve a work-based learning opportunity for these required credits, these seat time things, that's in place in the state of Montana. Yet the, the, the desire for them to get there, I think partially is due to one, what we hold them accountable for. We cannot say we wanna incentivize this and then not um, actually align that with the accountability. And then Bill, you said one other thing that I wanted to connect to that I think is really important. When you talk about the alignment of the systems, right? And I think about how we prepare our educators and our school leaders. It is counter to what we are asking of them in a learner-centered system. So they don't even experience that firsthand um, in their preparation program. So we've built this great like residency model, right? And we're trying to really encourage in this residency model to say, we just don't wanna put you back into a system for you'd be learning for a whole year in your residency, the same industrial model. How do we also be sure that they're getting infused with some new thinking and new learning firsthand that the approach they're getting is competency-based themselves yeah. so that they're demonstrating that competency and putting that to work. And so that when they're out as residents in the school systems, that they're also starting to rethink about how we redesign that role. So I think we've got to hold our schools accountable for what we really, what will drive a learner-centered system. I think we do I agree with you, Bill. We got to start thinking about all of those systems that are aligned to this from the time they're prepared to the time they're employing it um, and that we can't require the system in and of itself to figure this out by itself, because if it could, it would. It would have already and it would have been sustained. Um, and then I, I think um, what was the last thing I was just thinking about? And I do think that we have to redefine the role of educators. If we continue to use the model that we're using, one teacher, one classroom to everybody, it's a design issue. How we have them put in that, it's just a design issue overall. And I just don't think that we can expect the system itself to redesign itself without some level of support outside of it. Yeah, yeah, and, and I mean, both of you. I, mean, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, it's a design issue. It's an expectation issue. Is how we define success. Uh, this idea of a profile of a, of a graduate, I think, is a, is a fundamental thing we have to push. Uh, but in doing that, we also have to understand what we are defining as success. In so many places, it's a myopic definition, frankly, um, of success. So you both have talked about this idea of learner-centered, right? This idea of competencies, right? So in my prior lives, uh, I've seen kids being forced to completely retake a class again that they may have failed, uh, but but can't necessarily demonstrate that they have most of the competencies, but one perhaps is missing. So the work on assessment, I think that's to be a part of that. But what you both have articulated really, really well is that there's gotta be an interplay. One system depends on, on the other. Um, the last thing I'll say on this is uh, my friend, Michael McAfee, who runs Policy Link, uh, often pushes to me when we talk about systems change, is at what altitude systems change. Uh, I guess in our case, you were talking about perhaps district and state level systems. Let's shift a little bit and get to perhaps some of the concrete barriers that we know 
exists around policies and practices. Um, we know there's a lot of these that surround, for example, the adoption of instructional materials. We talked about assessment, but let's get into some of the curricula and instructional stuff. So many states and districts have extensive regulations and processes centered on the procurement of textbooks and related instructional materials. The paper also argues that these processes are also often centered on the degree to which materials are aligned to annual or grade level standards, a fixed design element of the industrial paradigm. Of course, as a result, we learned that, that we see that innovative learning models that prioritize a broader set of cognitive and non-academic outcomes or are designed to meet students' individual needs uh, in service of their long-term acceleration and success, right? Uh, can often be viewed as incompatible with these with these policies. So what are your thoughts on solving uh, the systemic barriers, perhaps around state and local policies, perhaps you may want to focus on the adoption of curricula and instructional materials, for example. Julie, you want to take this one first? <laughs> I can. Sure, Bill. <laughs> oh, what a great question, right? So think about the cycles, right, that lead to that curriculum adoption, everything that even comes before it, right? So we think about we've got our cycles of standard revisions and when we review them and then um, when we adopt them and then how long we give school districts time to adopt curriculum that align with that and what's really available and then implementing it right then we start talking about how do you implementing it with fidelity um, and uh, going through this whole cycle right and at what point in that entire conversation did we say anything about learners? Right. <laughs> okay, there are these huge systems that um, are um, built to to basically um, filter kids into everybody should fit in this box in this way, and that, and that's just not how learning goes. It is not this. And so we even how we define learning. And so when you're talking about the content and the standards and these curriculum, yeah, I mean, you could it, it doesn't matter which of these curriculum tools you, you you could do A, B or C at the end of the day, I would argue. Um, but if you don't have somebody who actually can be a facilitator of the learner and help a learner have that self-identity and have the agency and marry those two together, right? Um, um, that third part of the arm, I'm just thinking about the instructional core, right? The shift from student to learner, from teacher to facilitator of learning to then how do you marry the relationship between these two? Um, so if you're not at the same time addressing how you help kids with the process of being learner and addressing the issue of how you facilitate learning and you keep going with the same model, it doesn't really matter what curriculum you plug in there. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna continue to publish what they can scale and deliver on across multiple, multiple arenas. But I'm not so sure that our curriculum in and of itself is addressing those other two legs of the stool of saying, how do you actually in, in, you know, deliver this instruction? How do you actually engage learners to be learners in the process um, so that when they're interfacing with this tool, that it's going to work for them? But if we really think that the same tool is going to work for every student, I think that's what gets really difficult. And I think that's what I loved about new classrooms. I just I just want to say this, right? Was we are expecting teachers then to differentiate at a rate to individualize students in a way that is impossible to do on a daily basis, right? To take a curriculum and say, I'm going to differentiate this for every one of my students so that they, they can meet their needs and grow and make progression and growth with these standards, right? But that system every day, right? Differentiated and said, these are the different mod modules you're gonna do and this is the way you're gonna do it. So I think we've gotta think smart 
Jean and Bill, about technology. How are we using technology thoughtfully to differentiate that curriculum and really be personalized? And so um, I think it's going to take more than one curriculum tool. And I don't think it's just a technology based thing in and of itself. But I think in education, we got to learn how to use that technology tools to be smarter and faster. Julie, we can spend all afternoon talking about tech enabled teaching and learning. That is an area I'm passionate about. Uh, I'm not sure we'll have time to do that, but, but thank you for, for all of that, Bill. Yeah, so then I'll just build on Julie's point, Don Claude, and, and I think that number one, like, so here at KnowledgeWorks, the, our, our work and our mission is aligned to new classrooms work in their mission. In fact, we do a lot of uh, cross-pollination and, and collaboration around that work. But I, I do think, it, and this goes back a little bit to the question, that the prior question that you asked. And I think, you know, as we as we think about uh, this work, and I, I, I couldn't agree with Julie more that the curriculum, you know, we, we default to talking about the curriculum when you know that that becomes more of a symptom of something and of you know of the type of instruction a child is receiving than anything else and to julie's point like one set of resources for every single child understanding their individual needs is is just kind of silly right and then we ask teachers to make the decision and and we haven't prepared them to do that but i want to go back to the the, the prior question when you talked about like some of those barriers, and and I do think that, you know, in the in the paper it talks about just kind of the work that we were asking teachers to do, and and talking about a different type of educator and 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 changing the teacher rethinking the teacher development model, but I think we're asking them to do this and to be innovative and even giving them the opportunity and saying, hey, you have some autonomy to do um, A and B, but you don't have but for everything else, it's like all of these rules are here. Um, but I, that's why I wanna come back to, like a lot of the things that we found in Philadelphia, the, the, the and so, and, I, and I've always said, Jean-Claude, that you know we found the enemy, we discovered the enemy and it's us. And it was us through our policies, it was us through our practices. And I was just with, um, out, uh, uh, at a state talking to a group of superintendents, I'll, I'll I'll keep the state anonymous. When individuals talked about the ability to move children to 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 move children to uh, where they should be with respect to their grade level, but and in some cases they had the opportunity for middle school middle schoolers to take a certain level of math, but the state requirement was that you know that assessment for that particular math could only occur. Um, in in a certain grade. So that in and of itself then hampers the ability for like the system writ large. I mean, so the district could give all of the innovation in the world, but then the rules then it, it actually forces the structure um, to work within the bounds of said policy, the said practices. And that's why at KnowledgeWorks, we're working more from a systemic level with partners to focus on those systems that if done well, will create the conditions for learner-centered agency. Um, and, and so I do think that, and then instructional materials just become a byproduct of that, right? It's not the product, it's a byproduct of, of what you want um, in, as in, that's in response to what a learner needs. Bill, that, that's so, so well said, you know, we, so we build a box and you can only innovate within that box. The question is, how do you break out of the box? Uh, but to do that, to your point, you need the kind of systemic support and enablement to actually make that happen. If the assessments of my app are now focused, the economy is so much you can do. One more thing I'll add is that I, I was on the board of a large publishing company, large ed tech uh, uh, education curriculum company. And I'll tell you, they want to innovate. They want to do amazing things. 
but they're also beholden to the procurement and the purchases, right? If the folks at the state level or the district level are buying things or demanding certain things, they can't go too far outside of that as well too. So the interplay has to be, uh, I think, uh, uh, universal um, for all that kind, that kind of work. And, and, John, to, and John Claude, this, this they also, yes. they're also responsive to the fact that there's an assessment in grades three, four, yes. five, I mean, so they, they're also responsive to that point, right? And so that, yes. and and I'm not suggesting that we get rid of assessments, just saying we, yes. we have to rethink those to be flexible enough to dem yes. so that the demonstration of mastery doesn't necessarily yes. have to be like at a, a certain point in time or at a certain yes. grade level, but it could be um, a, it could be some sort of mastery based um, standard or proficiency that a young person is doing on a job site, um, for instance. Yes, and I'm watching now some development around funding for the future of assessment, redesign assessments, which I think is long overdue. Uh, and there are folks who actually are working on this. And then we can talk about this also at Nauseam. Uh, the ways in which we actually measure learning is so myopic and one dimensional that it prevents the kind of work that we see happening in Transcend, for example, at new classrooms. So, so lots of work we can do, we can do there. Uh, so I think Julie, earlier you talked a little bit about, if you do, you do it, Bill, uh, going outside the system. So, so Julie, in the case of Montana, you leverage your ESSA and ARP funding to design something called the Innovation Zones. How do you see this work lifting uh, our districts and school from the constraints of the industrial paradigm? What does it look like in Montana and what, what can other states, uh, state leaders learn from this approach? So, um, Jean Claude, that's a really good, good question. And we're getting ready to kind of launch out there with our math innovation zones and try to um, also work with this, the places that we know have already shown signs and, and of wanting to innovate. So, um, but we're kind of doing it in a twofold process. And we're thinking about it from both like a technical assistant provider and a model provider, right? So that we would have a technical assistant provider working with the community to first say, how do you have to prepare your system to implement this innovative math program? And a rubric that says, these are the indicators of what we want this technical assistant provider to help you get to. And then once you get there, then you can begin looking at a model provider. But you've got to have strong communication. You've got to have your stakeholders engage. What are those indicators that say you've readied the system so that you can begin to innovate? And I think one other piece that we're think that we're really going to be pushing on in this process is we haven't normally held technical assistant providers accountable. Right. Um, and so we, we get consultants and vendors all the time. Right. But we want we want technical assistant providers who we're going to hold accountable to say, you need to get our schools to this readiness stage. Yeah. And if they're not ready, you need to help them understand what they need to do to get ready. Because the system in itself needs that support to be able to, to, to work within its ecosystem too. And so you can't just take a technical, you can't just turnkey everything, especially in the state of Montana, right? You guys, we have, we have 80 one room schoolhouses, right? Which is almost this beautiful thing because if you think about a one room schoolhouse model, you're more likely not to be probably so structured on grade level, right? You got less than 10 kids. So I want you to think about there's that to our tribal land schools, to more of our, our you know, um, towns where there's, you know, bigger, bigger places in Montana that have larger school districts, right? Each of these look very different. When you're talking about um, the amount of school systems that we have in Montana, we have 400 districts um, in this state and we have 800 schools. So we are really vast, right? And so we have to acknowledge that where this school is situated in a community and the role that it plays in that community um, because it's really dynamic and diverse here. And so um, it's, 
So we need some technical assistant providers who are going to come in and say, we're working on shifting the system and redesigning the system with you, not for you. And we're not going to tell you how to do it, but we're going to tell you when we think you're where you are to begin working with a model provider. And then go for the math innovation zone. Because if we focus in on the model provider right away, right? that doesn't address all the things around it that are gonna be at play. And it's gotta be iterative. It's gotta be communicating back and forth with that technical advisor. So that's kind of what and, we're talking about. Yeah, and, and Julie, to your last point, it also, if you focus on the model, it also becomes a model-centered approach versus a learner-centered approach. And and I think like if we, you know, just, just kind of, changing the dialogue and the language around this work. I mean, and if we're truly thinking about every learner, then we would be truly thinking about these systems very differently right now. And we would think about time differently. We would think about assessments differently. And we would think about where learning occurs differently as well. And so I, I think to Julie's point that thinking about like the, the learner um, as we talk about partners and the providers is extremely important. Julie, Bill, thank you. Just Bill, staying with you for, for, for a bit. Uh, thinking about your life in, 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 um, in Philadelphia, what would you have wanted from the state to be able to get this work done? And if you be back on the second part of that question, now knowledge works, what are you doing to shift the world? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I, I'll, I'll hit the first one very quickly. And, and so when I talked about the like the competencies versus the mastery approach, um, and the, I'm sorry, the mastery versus the like the the standards and the, the grade level standards that had to be done at certain grade levels, um, then like having a state that was uh, more nimble um, and had more flexibilities around how we could measure learning, I think is, is very important. Um, and especially the use of time and how time was, how time was uh, recorded and how it is utilized. Um, but I think those, those I mean, and, and they sound very simple in nature, but become extremely hard and extremely confining um, to systems that are trying to innovate, right? So, uh, or just, the, uh, or subsystems that are trying to innovate. We didn't try to innovate the whole system. We were just trying to do it school by school. And some schools had to do it, but they had to lift themselves literally outside of that model. Um, the second, to your point at Knowledge Works, the thing that I talked about earlier is we're working with systems, we're working with systems, either districts, states, other organizations, to really look at how, to, how do you build um, the conditions and the components that support those conditions for personalized competency-based learning um, so that every learner is seen, heard, engaged, and that they have agency. And so that's the work that we're doing at KnowledgeWorks. I know we're running short on time, so I'll stop there. Yeah, let, let's, let's say this is a beginning conversation. Um, I think the paper does an amazing job of teeing up quickly what we need to be talking about. I think both of you have done an amazing job of talking about the interplay within systems. You can't just do this in a one-dimensional myopic way. You've got to take a look at the 360 degrees that is systems change. We really want to thank uh, you, Julie and Bill, for your time. This has been a terrific conversation.